Welcome to the ProCom Podcast, hosted by Paul Vogels, with expert guest interviews, case study reviews, and insightful discussion topics. The ProCom Podcast leads the project controls conversation. So, welcome everybody to the next episode of the ProCam Podcast. As you all are aware, we are leading the project controls conversation and we're doing it by people, processes and tools. Uh, so besides the educational tracks and the use cases, we have a software special. And today I have a very special guest. Mrs. Ross Buk, PhD, um, Senior Vice President and Oracle Construction and Engineering Global Business Unit. Ross, thank you for being on this show. Yeah, you're welcome. Great to be here. All the way from Colorado. So we uh, we had to struggle a little bit with time zone. So it's almost the end of the day in the, in the Netherlands, uh, beginning of the day in Colorado. So uh, thank you very much. A short introduction on you because it's a it's a it's a strong introduction. Eh? So you are senior vice president at Oracle, also a board director in sub construction and technology companies, a trained in research scientist eh? in a couple of universities. Bachelor of Agriculture Science, that's something we're going to talk about, a PhD in Computer Simulation Modeling, and an Executive MBA. And I see you have a strong background at growing teams, digitalization, and transforming industries, but also a strong, long-life learner. And I think if I look at your resume, you are a living example of that. <laughs> so, Russ, tell me a little bit, why did you start as a... I, artificial intelligence uh, um, uh, in or why did you start as agriculture science and then went into computer simulation models oh well i think it's really because i never could kind of decide exactly what i wanted to be actually um did an ag agricultural science degree which was very broad and uh covered everything from economics to you know engineering and and agri uh, biolo bio biological sciences and chemistry and all, all but then when i got to a phd i had a phd that spanned plant physiology adjuvant chemistry for those um maybe interested in that it's formulations um of chemicals to be more effective and, uh, and also computer simulation modeling. And I got very interested in how the AI and decision support systems codifying, if you like, expertise into software as well as the simulation modeling angle and took a, a postdoc in Virginia Tech uh, in the US. Um, I was a New Zealander to begin with mm -hmm. and uh, very much enjoyed um, the uh, the, te the technology lab that I worked in in Virginia, where we were being funded by EPA, Soil and Water Conservation, and various other, uh, I suppose, government agencies uh, largely to help them automate and standardize the way complex decision making was being made. And that often required understanding expertise and how to codify that. And so AI in its early days, machine yep. learning, neural nets, uh, expert systems, uh, but com combining that with um, artificial intelligence algorithms, operations research optimization algorithms, or simulation models. So we were kind of mashing all this stuff up to bring together a end user, very applied software to the end user. And so that's how I went to down my research path for a number of years, both in the US and New Zealand, and did some university teaching. Yep. And decided to jump to the dark side in the mid-90s and took a job with Trimble Navigation out of New Zealand at that time. Their big question was, can we sell GPS to farmers? And so that's the sort of challenge that was put upon about five of us where we started off in the business. And, uh, yeah, within about... Um, I'd say five years, we really had cracked what was the focus of the strategy. I was very much on the product strategy side. And so transforming the cab, we basically took the idea of turning the machine into a more automated environment where it's easier to drive long hours very, very accurately from swath to swath or pass to pass. And GPS was central to doing that. And then automating that with integration into hydraulic control control yep. loop software, inertials, and so on. So we eventually got the tractors and the combines down to sort of an inch accuracy. Right. And 
And uh, yeah, the whole experience was amazing because it was both product strategy and go to market distribution strategy too. Yep. And building with, with a that. strong IT or strong coding uh, foundation, of course. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You had to be very technical in this job. And and then uh, it, it ended up being a very big business at Trimble, which was great to see and uh, still is today one of the five big franchise businesses. Uh, and we moved into more software increasingly from just hardware, of course, because controlling an automated machine re requires software and planning soft, uh, office software. Yep. Um, I switched to civil construction uh, in about mid 2000s, uh, and it was the engineering um, and civil construction business that focused on automating dozers, excavators, um, motor graders, pavers, pretty much every machine you can think of, but mm -hmm. it was much more about controlling the machine and the elevation as well as the XY position for GPS so we um, had a great time there doing lots of fun uh, product strategy. And I was the general manager of the business for about nine years and building out a global distribution network of partners um, who were focused on uh, delivering technology for this business and working very closely with the Caterpillar dealer principles in that way. And that was an amazing experience. You know, we had dealer partners in Mongolia and Siberia, as well as New Zealand, Australia, all over the US um, and really helping dealers understand how to be really great at selling and supporting and servicing technology for a construction job site. Yep. Um, so then I switched, uh, you know, and became the senior vice president of buildings technology, which was largely a lot of software acquisitions at Trimble. Uh, that was an amazing ride to businesses all over the world. Um, flagship brands like SketchUp and Tecla and so I had about five general managers reporting to me there, and we basically built out a strategy again on how to be um, transforming the industry across design, build, and operate for vertical construction, if you like. Yep. Uh, and after that, I thought, well, it's maybe time for change, 24 years in one company. and. Mm -hmm. Uh, took some time off and thought I might, uh, you know, not do much other than board roles. But this job came along with Oracle and lo and behold, it's sort of as a, I thought opportunistic AI, machine learning and data being very central to the strategy. Uh, and of course, that being something I spent many years on. Yeah, so, um, it looks like a perfect fit huh? because you have, if, yeah, we're going to talk about innovation labs and about artificial intelligence. But if I hear this story again, you are a perfect fit because hey, you know how to code probably or, or can anticipate uh, and, and talk <laughs> with the coders. Uh, probably yeah, that's an advantage. Um, you know how to how to steer dozers, etc. with 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 AI, etc. Um, well, it's a lot, in, in my opinion, I think the recruiter will, will confirm this. It's a logical transition because you are still doing what you're doing and you're even lifting Oracle eh, Construction Engineer and Global Business as it is now. Eh? We're going to talk about where it all uh, started eh? and, and, and we're going to explain this little secret uh, over here. Um, <laughs> yeah. But you're building upon the fundaments of what DCEGBU is at this moment. So perfect yeah. fit to... Uh, I think. Yeah, hope so. I, I think so. And it's fun because of the capacity and strength of what Oracle brings to the table in going to the cloud with significant large scale databases and managing that with AI and machine learning. All of that is uh, a hard problem to solve, to be efficient and optimize. And so if anyone can solve it, I believe Oracle can a relative to building a data centric platform and a smart construction platform that's really the, the essence of our strategy. So yeah, I'm learning lots, of course, I've been here a year, but uh, feel like we've got a good uh, strategy locked in and, and it's all about rolling out uh, many facets of the strategy execution now. Yeah. And so yeah, that's pretty much my story. And I think, you know, what's been good for me I, over the years is just so much diversity of <clears throat> or, you know, different market challenges, different workflows or business processes we were trying to build and automate or standardize and help the end user ultimately be more efficient, more productive, have higher quality, higher safety, 
whatever that sort of goodness is, it's generally the same benefits, but it's also um, kind of fascinating to look at it for different markets and different users, I find. So, yeah. Yeah, because I I don't know if everybody is aware of that. So Oracle is famous about their databases and about their hyper systems, etc. Within Oracle, you have a global business unit structure where you are a, a vice president of the global, um, sorry, construction engineering global business unit. It actually started by the acquisition of Primavera, and that's where I found this box. Eh? It's in our office. Eh? We have a we call it the museum. There's old old um, uh, old software. Eh? It's actually a serial port. Eh? If you are if you started with GPSs and coding, eh? you probably have worked with these uh, a little fellows. Yeah. Primavera P3 is what Primavera Inc. Uh, developed early 80s. Eh? And even in the back, uh, I didn't realize, but in the back uh, of my uh, of my studio, Joel Kappelman, one of the founders, is uh, is sitting there and, and telling something about risk. Uh, also, for example, this box represents the start of the Primavera Global Business Unit. This is the scheduling tool Oracle acquired in 2008, 2009, early 2009. And, and we, as PrimaNet, it's, it's the office where we are sitting in, started actually as Primavera Netherlands, where we used to resell this in, in Europe. Um, mm. And in this, can you tell me something about what you have learned in, in this year we started with the Primavera Global Business Unit, and now uh, it's the Construction Engineering Global Business Unit with a lot of acquisitions, uh, Perth yeah. Master, Unifier, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it almost is the same path as uh, you have been experienced from, from a single something, uh, in this case scheduling, into complete project controls for the um, construction engineering verticals, yeah infrastructure, owners, et cetera. Can you tell me a little bit about this, this roadmap Oracle CGBU has been through? Mm, yes. Um, well, what is great about uh, Primavera and P6, P3 all the way through, it's really an institution in the industry, quite frankly. And that was another exciting reason for joining Oracle in my mind, because scheduling is one of those really hard problems the industry really um, has I think solved a lot to some degree for the scheduler and project controls, but also there's a lot of potential, I think, for scheduling to be um, a key theme across the entire project dynamics and ecosystem when you're designing and building projects that we can we can drive into the future. And so, yeah, for me, um, that was another good reason to come to the team Oracle's construction and engineering group but it's a lot, it's an interesting story because um, it sort of matches the evolution of the industry in a lot of ways. But Oracle bought Primavera about 2008, um, and then uh, Skya, which is the product unifier, Textura, and Aconex was more recent. Um, so that was kind of the sequence over several years. Yep. And I think you know now the opportunity for us is to bring a lot of those capabilities, and it's less about changing the way an individual persona works. So we always need to serve software up to the end user's needs, yep. let's say. But it's more about democratizing through data and helping empower each of the users on a job site or on a project to really see and understand their data, not just their workflow and CPM, but maybe what's happening over in payments and automated uh, you know, supply chain management areas with Textura or what's happening on the collaboration document controls front uh, or model-based workflows within Aconex yep. and helping provide, let's say, the scheduler or project, <clears throat> excuse me, project controls person more of a window to what's going on through democratized data. And if you don't have a platform that's designed for data, then you can't solve this problem. And, you know, the history of the industry, just to reference that evolution, has really been siloed digital tools to begin with that served individual personas and that met their needs out of the gate and various departments and teams could go digital, let's say. But that didn't really solve the bigger problem and give people more of a coordinated, uh, synchronized 
approach to the project. Mm -hmm. And so the next step was really connected and collaboration project management system where it was really often about sharing documents and files mostly. Uh, and there being the project manager at the table there more often than not. But how do you orchestrate between office and field and connect people and designers and engineers and contractors and subcontractors and such? We think the next big leap is going to be about smart uh, platforms or intelligent platforms that can be a lot more leveraging the AI, machine learning, and the ability to take the data that really matters to every workflow uh, and make it available to be visible in whatever form that makes sense to the end user makes it easier for them to really know what's going on on the wider project. It's a way you can think it's enhancing scheduling because if I'm a scheduler and I can get a better understanding of other dynamics on the project while I'm scheduling yeah. uh, and updating schedules, it enhances the scheduler's workflow, but it also can enhance the project manager's workflow or even the finance accounting teams with payment management to their supply chain. And so... We think it's a bit of change in strategy because hey, it, it, with the acquisition of Primavera and Skyer, et cetera, it's, it's a buy strategy. Now, for example, with the, with the development of Oracle Primavera Cloud, OPC, you know, which, which gives yeah. you the opportunity to have this new platform. And you say the scheduler wants a better schedule, the risk manager wants a better risk uh, analysis, et cetera. It reminds me of um, Henry T. Ford, you know him, People want a faster horse, where Henry thought that you don't want a faster horse, you want something else. Is that the change in strategy where, for example, the construction and engin engineering industry is the most conservative besides agriculture, which is even more uh, conservative if you look at McKinsey reports, but the, the one of the most conservative industries is OPC, Oco Primavera, making you a platform where you can anticipate more on the end user because yes, we need tools. Yes, we need processes. Right? It's the plan, build, operate process you're talking about in making a, a building and maintaining it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, is OPC the change in strategy and the developing of OPC and all the other analytics tools you are creating? Is that the change of strategy to be more, I don't, agile is a, is a high, but to be more flexible to the end user needs? Yeah, I think, uh, well, it's all the products really coming together. There's a lot of critical mass and value in each product we acquired. So we are definitely focusing our strategy. We call it the smart construction platform to really look across the major groups uh, needs, owners and delivery teams we categorize yep. as. But OPC is a part of the puzzle and certainly an absolutely critical part of the puzzle when it comes to portfolio management and scheduling CPM and task uh, lean, uh, connecting it all the way to the job site. Yep. But AConnex also is very important. You know, how do you keep track of the changes in the requirements on the project and RFIs and such, and also the ability to take that from office to field and back? Uh, and, of course, the whole idea of a true, fair and equitable collaboration system where you, uh, you know, you control your data and you share the data you want to share with somebody else but you're not at the mercy of, you know, someone else owning the project management system and demanding you to enter it into their system yep. and you have to do it into your own system. So the whole science of collaboration is very um, uh, important to get right, we believe, and AconX for us has got this strong philosophy in uh, a fair um, system, if you like, that builds trust between, between the partners on a project. Yep. Um, and Texture is a really... Yeah, sorry. Texture is the other really key uh, foundational product as well as Unifier, of course. Unifier more geared for the owner and the full asset lifecycle uh, management, you know, obviously starting to decide, you know, how to spend your capital program up front and then all the way through the assets life, how do you manage and optimize the way you manage that. And the digital twin is inevitably a part of our journey too with the strategy, because as we go through the design build, we're actually f fundamentally building a digital library or signature of the entire project or assets life as you've been designing and building it. And all of that information is absolutely key going forward into the operations and maintenance phase. 
So, um, yeah, digital twin is not just one BIM model. It's actually all of that key information through the life of the asset that we are, you know, furnishing to the owner uh, through the project's completion. Um, but the, but the, the really hard part of construction, I think, is in that middle build phase that we will be very actively orchestrating. And we talk about three key elements um, uh, connect, empower, and synchronize. And so connecting people is the foundations of what that second phase in the industry's evolution. I mentioned you want to connect more of the data, more of the parties to better understand what's going on in real time. Uh, empower is the AI machine learning, provide predictive intelligence about schedule risk, um, issues with schedules that you need to think about before they happen and have time yep. to mitigate. Uh, often that's not the case, um, or it's very challenging to be that connected. So our construction intelligence cloud is a new product that helps, if you like, sit across all our products, but focusing first and foremost on schedule, because that's where we have such an incredible uh, capacity to, yep. to be in smarter about how you build out these smart models for each customer. And the critical um, mass in, in the end user, I think, Almost Absolutely. every schedule is familiar with or with this box or P6 or whatever, but I think yeah. everybody needs a schedule and that's where project controls usually start. Eh? If you look at PMI, it's exactly. time, scope and cost, where time everybody uses because time is inevitable. Um, uh, and if you don't do anything, time will be running away from you at the end. Yeah. So, so I think scheduling is your is your foundation and you're building it out. And, and that's, yeah. I think, where, where CIC, Cloud Intelligence, um, is going to help you on this schedule because yeah, we always say a project is a project and, and every project is unique, but there are some common data or some common uh, procedures in building a road, no matter if it goes from Amsterdam to Rotterdam or from uh, Houston to Colorado, for example. It's a, it's a road at the end. Yep, that's right. I like to say schedule is the operational heartbeat of yep. every project. And it's key that we enable more people to see what the schedule is doing in a way that helps them do their job, I believe. And that's very much part of our smart construction yep. platform strategy. And in fact, the third word, synchronize, is exactly that. So it's all about understanding how to synchronize not just ultimately around schedule, because, you know, payments and contract management matters too, um, to be aware of that against the schedule and the plan that you had. Uh, but it's synchronization and, like, like I mentioned, the data democratization idea. You're really helping more people understand the wider dynamics of the project ecosystem ecosystem. And that's a hard problem the industry has been trying to solve for a long time, yeah. I, I think. And so we're going out after, you know, what they say in America, go big or go home, right? This is an important and big um, big goal. But I think we have a great uh, capability to, tack to tackle it because of our legacy with Primavera and scheduling yep. uh, and, and the combination, of course, with these other products. So, um, so yeah, I'm super excited about it. And I think you, you mentioned how bespoke construction is. I know there's trends to modular and standardization of supply chain, all these great things. But I think for many years yet, we'll still have a lot of bespoke behavior in the industry. Yep. And uh, not just, you know, from a perspective of buying drywall or steel and concrete and all of that. Mm -hmm. It's also the digital ecosystem yep. that's going to be on every project. And so one of the core tenets of the strategy is that we want to be this digital backbone, uh, if you like, for the key things we do really, really well, but be very, very easy to plug into as any ecosystem digital partner comes along, whether it's yep. IoT, labor equipment materials tracking on a job site, or more automated um you know, processes like reality capture of progress and productivity or safety and quality. Uh, those things, you know, wherever you go, whether it's Germany or Mongolia or wherever it might be, there's different local players and we want to make sure we can plug into those. So certainly we've been test driving a lot of the uh, innovation and partnership there through our innovation labs as well uh, to help us learn and validate and improve the way we can connect to the various players. 
And is, is, is cloud helping you? Because huh, I, I used Absolutely. to be an informatics uh, uh, master of science in informatics. I used to work with these guys huh, with these floppy disks, with the big floppy disk. Huh? It took ages to put them in, one huh, one out of 13, one, two, <laughs> yeah. et cetera. With cloud, it's almost a push of a button to update or to upgrade a, a technology. Is is that, is that why Oracle huh, and, and all major software players are moving more and more into cloud power-based uh, infrastructure. You have your own OCI system, of course, uh, where the database foundation of this old Oracle machine, uh, this robust old uh, Oracle machine is very strong. So is that where the move to cloud is supporting you in this, let's call it flexibility to, to work in these bespoke processes or bespoke people? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, there's many... Uh, technology IT trends, I suppose you could argue, enabling and coming together in the combination. I think today the word integration is innovation in many ways because a lot of the things like ba high bandwidth, 5G, cloud capacity and performance, um, edge computing even, you know, um, there's many, many aspects coming together that are greatly uh, transforming just in core IT sense, um, the ability for anyone in a software role um, to, to optimize the way we can solve problems uh, that were really, really hard in the past. You know, when I was in AI in the old days, that was one, they were real issues. We couldn't get enough data to train machines, you know, to train the neural nets. Um, now you can get a lot more lot more data in the cloud and you can do that. Now, we, we're very sensitive to customer data and ownership of data at Oracle and security of data. So mm -hmm. we have a lot of work on high compliance and meeting FedRAMP and GDPR and various uh, high compliance standards around the world too because security of data and um, compliance is a key strategy, part of our strategy too. Yep. But I would say the, uh, <clears throat> the notion of, the cloud is one aspect of it, but it's many, many facets, I think, coming together um, and helping all of us be able to solve the harder problems more easily. And yeah, you know, you could argue, is it the, is it the service trend? Wall Street wants ARR and, you know, yeah. that annual recurring revenue nirvana, let's say, what's pulling the whole thing? I don't know, but the move to services is an inv inevitable trend in most well, the businesses. The funny thing is uh, with, with subscription, yeah, because ARR is about subscription-based, uh, uh, a project is a subscription. We start something, we end something. That's the, the, the ice yeah. let me Let me go ask you a question and explain it to you. So you have this big technology product suite ready. And you have the most conservative industry you're gonna <laughs> sell this to. Are you selling glasses to blind people or are we going to educate those construction guys and girls to say, okay, we we can't mortar any faster and module is going to help us, but it's also about improving efficiency, improving intelligence, not surveying anymore how many cubic feet of uh, of uh, uh, asphalt we uh, we put into the uh, into the road how are you convincing this conservative uh, industry with the end user huh? how are you connected with the end user in the field well i think every industry that i've ever worked in it's evolution revolution to some to get some degree so there is a there is a a natural adoption curve that happens as more digital natives come into the industry inevitably. Yep. As the challenge in workforce talent, you know, the industry's really um, not, there's not a lot of people who want to go into construction. And so the two forces, I believe, mean that who you do hire will be looking for more automated processes and more digital uh, ways to do things. And not only that, because of things like Construction Intelligence Cloud, we can greatly improve a new employee's skill set mm -hmm. on how to be a good scheduler by this predictive intelligence, um, anticipating the issues and risks in schedule before they happen. <clears throat> and that our whole idea of um, automating and driving intelligence from past project experience, which if you can think about the 
number of past projects in P6 um, or P3 through P6, <laughs> we're really taking this, I think, very innovative step for the industry to take, if I'm a customer A, all my past project intelligence with me going forward into the construction intelligence cloud so we can tap into that learning that all my very old experienced uh, schedulers who may be about to retire yep. um, ha- can then be used as intelligence to drive future projects. And so very excited about the fact that uh, it's not getting left behind because that's what most technology players have had to do or have tended to do. Uh, and so we think that's a huge opportunity for the industry to learn and automate uh, uh, their processes, not just in scheduling, but certainly yeah. certainly starting there. And but the yeah. next, next level project controls engineer doesn't have a civil engineering degree, but he has a data or informatics degree, for exactly. example. Yeah. yeah, and and how so Oracle is is I think the biggest or at least one of the biggest software vendors in the in the world. Hey, you have an outreach from from New Zealand all the way to to the the, the yeah. west coast, and from I think well Scandinavia all the way to uh, to South Africa. I was talking to a guy in South Africa l- lately. Um, you have a partner landscape, you have a customer landscape, you have a direct sales, a direct consulting, and services. How are you getting all this? Feedback because well this is not something we we think about in the in the Oracle headquarters. This is from the guys and girls who are were a hard hat in the field who need to make the schedule. What's the Oracle philosophy on gaining insight in the needs of the market? Yeah, well I've spent many years talking to customers and partners and sales teams. Really, the three I would say are very important because. You still have to win the hearts and the minds of the partners and the sales organization as you put product strategy through to the end user. And of course, you have to meet the end user's ultimate needs in what the product does. So I think all of those um, are incredibly important uh, as a product strategist. And what we're doing is a variety of things, um, trying to make sure that we talk to customers as well as talk to the sales and channel partners Um, going forward, you know, all my product management, product strategy leads, we have various mechanisms to do that. We're actually looking at more formalizing um, a product advisory board process going forward as well. Uh, I believe there's a number of industry councils across Oracle that take place. Uh, And so we want to really be proactive on that front as much as possible, always as product strategy people never build product in a vacuum. We even have uh, a process where we map out with the customer, even virtually through digital tools, how to better understand workflows that are much more attractive and going to be used by the customer, but involve the customer in those design steps and uh, with our user experience team. So we are very actively uh, working to establish all the right um, a number of hours of touch and communication with customers and partners around these kinds of things. You know, I've been in Oracle for just over a year. So some of these are getting kicked off as new things. Some of them have already been in place. Um, But I I think, you know, if there's, if you think you can build product because you're really smart and you know what the customer wants without talking to them, then you're very misguided. Uh, And yeah, I mean, I think the other big thing I'll say about going to the cloud is, it becomes more like a service 24-7. You know, you watch Netflix. If it goes down, how frustrating that is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in construction, you can't have downtime. It's even more important. We've got to be a 24-7 service that's the highest reliability as possible. So working very hard to make sure that our products are secure, compliant, available, um, highly performant in the cloud, And I do have great faith, the company's, you know, very much investing in OCI, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, and how to solve that, you know, we maybe weren't first to the cloud, but taking third or second generation approach to it, we can really think, well, how to do this with very large databases that the company like ERP, for example, um, how to really solve that in the cloud and do a really better job at how that performance works. So, I think uh, we have all the right foundations to solve this problem. 
uh, better than the next guy, I think. And uh, But, yeah, the cloud is a key part of becoming a service provider as well. Yeah. And that's, that's going to help customers, you know, there's less pressure on each customer having to be an IT department to, to deploy all of that themselves, although we still need IT, CIO, C security, you know, um, cybersecurity type people in every company. But uh, I think that means there's a shift to make it easier for customers to adopt as well over time. Yeah. Um, and with this, uh, so you're talking about that, uh, we need to collaborate, uh, we need to synchronize, uh, everybody needs to uh, be aware of what uh, what the what the other guy is doing or girl is, uh, is doing. You were ready for this two years ago. Did the pandemic prove yeah. your strategy right or did it help you to convince people you don't need to run into the office to your laptop type in whatever you need just get probably your own computer or your 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 laptop from the office yeah. in plug in 5g or internet or whatever and you can work wherever whenever uh, on every device did this prove your strategy it's, yeah, it's a terrible think- thing of course the pandemic but did it prove something to to you and to your customers I think, well, I think um, going digital generally from the coronavirus uh, pandemic has been, yep. has has become the thing. You know, it's it's every company realizes the benefit of making their products available digitally, right, versus a storefront or um, face-to-face. So I think, yes, if anything, what we're seeing is a, a, a major acceleration in the remote off-site, um, you know, automated, standardized processes, how do you capture the progress, such as um, the reality capture tools or IoT sensor tools, and feed that back to the office in more real time. So I think that remote job site management idea is very much going to go uh, even beyond where it already is at, but it's going to grow very, very quickly. We see that with, you know, whether it's, drone um, companies or we see it with uh, our own partners in the ecosystem and how they're working with us. Uh, It's not to say you don't need people on the job site at all. I think there will be always a need for ground truthing. Um, I worked, you know, with even augmented reality. You can't replace the fact that you need experience on the job and also, um, you know, the context of seeing the digital model, for example, on the job site, once the project's gone live and things go in place, but they're not in the right place. Yep. There's always changes that have to happen, no matter how great your collaboration at the front end is between designers and contractors around BIM collaboration tools. You've got a level of ground truth thing, I think, that will always be there. You know, as things get more, more modular pre-construction, there may be less and less of that, but it's still the assembly, at least, on the job site. Yeah. Well, well, when you're actually out in the mud, you need to you need to feel it. You need to see it. You need to. Yeah. yeah. Is that also why? Because we, I'm aware with with the with the Oracle landscape, of course, but everybody is aware Oracle is building innovation, and everybody is thinking, why is that? You're a software vendor. You're building a building. It's your own building. Why not grant a contract to a to a big building contract to say, I want this office building. It should look like this. Go figure it out. I'll I'll be there for the grand opening. Why did Oracle make the decision to test it out yourself? Why are you being a general contractor and not a software vendor in in the innovation labs all around the world nowadays? Well, I think the the reason is we want customers to be able to see it in action, of course, but... You know, eating your own. It's not a showroom. It's not your it's showroom. Not a showroom. No, it's definitely not just a showroom. It's about um, learning through partnering and establishing the process ourselves with our own tools and bringing digital partners to the table. Like I mentioned a little earlier, uh, the digital ecosystem is very bespoke as well as the construction supply chain. So really learning in concert with the realities of doing it um, and applying our technology ourselves and applying innovation to partnerships with other companies as well as across our own products is really, really helpful from a product strategy point of view. And industry, I believe, industry brand and partnership and overall industry innovation. 
So I'm super excited about these labs. We've got various locations around the world, but the big, the big one that's uh, finished, I suppose, and, and can be seen is in Chicago. And we've had many thousands of customers, even in 2021, remotely being through it. Um, and so we continue to use it as a, as a real platform to demonstrate our commitment to the industry as well as our ability to innovate and partner with uh, those who, uh, you know, there's many aspects, if you like, around the industry that can be benefiting from technology and we can't solve all of them. Uh, we can solve some very big ones, um, yep. but we need partners and we need to make ourselves easy to connect with and synchronize the data with with our third party ecosystem of digital uh, providers. So yeah, many, many partners across the landscape on the Chicago lab um, that we have been working with. And uh, I'm excited because it's also a great location uh, to be able to take customers ultimately and get them to touch and feel and yep. see I've worked in ag and construction many years. I'm a big believer that both sectors are very much about seeing before they believe. And uh, it's, I grew up on a farm. My father was, you know, very pragmatic, practical person. Uh, I think software, it's not like buying a dozer or an excavator that you feel and touch and see what you get for your money. Buying software and digital is a lot harder to get the value straight away. So I think, having the ability to go see and touch and understand for customers is massively important in the transformation. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm thrilled that we get to be able to do that at Oracle and build these out around the world. Yeah. So it's the best example of uh, the, the, the proof of the pudding is by eating it. You yeah. are eating it fully with your partners with uh, I've seen I've seen drill uh, suppliers who have IOT on it I've seen drone suppliers I have seen uh, 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 automatic surveyors etc etc this is a platform for your partners to actually test it in live action this is mm -hmm. a commitment to that partner landscape this is it's a showroom as well huh, for the farmer to to taste uh, the, uh, the, yeah. the 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 pudding in mm -hmm. in this um But it makes you very different. It's it's changing a mindset, I think. So yes, you have a great set of tools. It's the tool part. The processes are automated, flexible, etc. There's owners that are delivery teams. You are an owner of a office, but you're also making your own delivery team. Did you learn something from this innovation oh. lab which you couldn't have anticipated on paper? Yes, absolutely. Um I think everybody is always surprised at how much you learn by putting your products to test in the real world as product managers or developers even. So yes, absolutely a ton of learning. You know, I've always said about construction is for it to be able to level up with the other industries, it's a it's really about um, the parallels with manufacturing is Lean Six Sigma, which is all about continuous continuous improvement, right? So what gets measured gets managed, essentially. So you've got to start understanding the timeframes or the micro metrics. And this is very much core to our AI machine learning concepts within our product strategy. But we too have to be on a path of continuous improvement. And so by applying ourselves to the real world with our tools, we quickly see where things are too many steps or difficult to integrate or whatever it might be. Uh, and so, yeah, bring us down to earth quickly. But that whole concept of continuous improvement, no one in any business is um, immune, uh, if I can say that word these days, yeah. um, to, to uh, you know, basically this concept of continuous improvement, which means you need to start measuring the things that you're doing and understanding not just sort of financial outputs and P&Ls, but the micro processes and metrics going on within what you serve up to your customers in terms of process efficiency or uh, what you're doing on a job site, managing and orchestrating supply chain teams. Um, so I think, you know, um, the medicine's good for both of us, right? Um, and we just got to keep, uh, keep working that way. And I think Oracle, what I'm excited about Oracle, you know, is, is quickly changing. I, I believe, you know, lots of, new ideas, new people in the company that are also bringing a lot of cloud experience and 
innovation ideas across the global business units. There are 10 vertical business units that do different industries, we being one of them, construction and engineering, but also in core Oracle and how they're moving to the cloud. So it's a very exciting time at the company in terms of uh, transformation and uh, you know how we are innovating across the front and massive opportunities for a business unit to leverage that core capability. Um, you know, one of the things, for example, is usability and design and user experience and a lot of investment into the Redwood design um, uh, capabilities in the, in the software. And so we are really transforming the way our products look and feel and behave. And that's exciting too for product development and product strategy teams. Well, and you are in this tilting, eh? so you, you mentioned a couple of minutes earlier there are a, there's a younger generation coming into into management levels into board uh, levels. Mm-hmm. I'm a Xenial, eh? born in 1982. Eh? I'm as old as Primavera is exactly. Yeah. Um, I'm a Xenial, so I I am old enough to know eh, what's in here, what's a floppy disk, and eh? not just by the 3D print of a Microsoft Word save button. Eh? I actually worked with those guys, but I'm young enough to see what cloud computing, what Spotify, eh? I have Spotify on my phone, I watch Netflix, yes. eh? I, I I get rid of the cable uh, subscription, for example. This generation, my generation, eh? almost 40, eh? uh, this is going to be cut out, of course, in the uh, podcast. Um, this generation <laughs> is coming into the management stream. Eh? They are going to be the construction managers. They are going to be the asset owners. This gives you the right landscape, I think, also from a product point of view, but also from a people point of view, that they understand yeah. what it was like in the early days, but they are bright enough and, and clever enough and agile enough to see, okay, if we are going with this transition, this is where the where the um, what we're gaining, what we uh, what the revenue will be from an efficiency point of view, from a continuous improvement point of view. So. Mm-hmm. You just got on board in the right time, I think, for this for this tilting yeah. point. Yeah, I, I hope you see so. Your customers? Sorry, what was that last question? Do you see the? Are you talking also to the to the new management, to the new younger? Yes, um, yes. I, I mean, I would say my experience in talking to customers, the ones that get you know, change management's a hard problem, right, for any company, and that fundamentally it's people, process, and tools. Yep. So you've got to have the right balance of people and talent on board, whether it's digital natives or experienced construction um, gurus. But, you know, you, you have to, as an executive, on uh, really understand the significance of executive sponsorship and change management from the strategy down. So the best companies I've seen, actually some great ones in the Netherlands too, uh, contractors that really think about the problem from uh, the top down and how's that going to change the way the company as a whole, not just say, hey, you know, IT manager, go buy some software in this company and solve this problem. That doesn't solve the bigger opportunity in transformation of how things are done. And, and you know, it really is um, an exciting time in construction. And I think the pandemic is going to only accelerate it. I think, People are much more aware of going digital. I've been to many um, sort of McKinsey summits where they bring in the C-suite. And there's definitely uh, sort of dare in the headlights often going on about going digital because they're like, well, we don't know where to start. But then, you know, if you bring in the younger people at the same time, you can start to have much more interesting conversations about what the challenges are, what the tools are to be able to solve some of these things. So you do have to you do have to think about this opportunity as a whole change management challenge for the industry, and part of our role is to really try and help educate and drive thought leadership in that yep. to say how do you um, go about this? If I'm the CEO of a big construction design build or a, uh, EPC delivery firm, what's the what's the value creation for my firm going forward and um, yeah, I think there's masses of opportunity there and it's really um, education and continually trying to present the story in a consumable way for all to, to, to hear it and understand it, but also to really understand your talent mix on board, the people side, looking at your processes holistically and ultimately the tools. 
that you need to support it. Um, so, you, yeah, I mean, I think the best examples of customers I've seen are where they really get it from the top down and they really encourage the younger ideas. It doesn't have to be a younger person, just the younger ways of solving, the more modern ways of solving things to come to the fore at the executive level on, on the company. Yep. Yeah. If you do what you did, you will get what you got in the end. So the yeah. changing is, I think, very, very important. Um, Ross, thank you very much. Yeah? I think you you touched on really good points. Yeah? We need to be more aware of this change, of the of the, of the possibilities and the opportunities we have in the project controls um, a toolkit, uh, for example. And I think where, where Primavera and Oracle CEB2 is, is one of the leaders and drivers of this change on real hardcore project controls, uh, time, money, risk, uh, uh, et cetera. Um, I warned you before uh, we could talk until your noon and it's only uh, it's only nine o'clock or 10 o'clock in your time. Um, but, but we really want to have people to do this in a, in a, in a way they can consume it. And so and we're running out of time. Well, we will be back at the end. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. I really liked the story of uh, where your educational part went into the, to the experience where you're driving it from a, from a new company, but in the same way at the end, eh? automating a dozer or a dozer at the, at the construction site. I really enjoyed it. Eh? I really want to be in the um, innovation lab when uh, when the pandemic uh, allows us. I think that's a, that's a great way uh, for maybe a net next uh, podcast at the end. Um, thanks again, uh, Ross Buk, uh, Senior Executive and Senior Vice President, Oracle Construction Engineering Global Business Unit. Thank you very much. And to the people at home or in the office or wherever you are consuming this podcast, please stay tuned, log into proconpodcast.com and subscribe to the next podcast because besides the software special, we're going to have actual use cases on projects and uh, and some educational tracks on new methodologies. So with this uh, leading the project controls conversation, um, please visit the website, subscribe to Apple or podcast or whatever subscription-based model you are using to uh, to consume a uh, podcast uh, on demand wherever. Eh? So that's always changing, yeah? also changing, Ross. Eh? We don't have the uh, records anymore. We just log into Apple Podcasts and uh, listen to what we want to listen. Um, thanks, everybody listening at home. Thank you very much. Ross Buk, Oracle. Thanks. Thank you for the opportunity, Paul. Have a great one. Have a great one. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the Procom podcast. To listen and watch more episodes, you can subscribe and access the resources mentioned in this episode by visiting proconpodcast.com. We look forward to seeing you on our next episode, where we will continue to lead the project controls conversation. The Procom podcast and the associated resources is published under copyright to Prima Ned. All rights reserved, no reproduction of this content is permitted.